that's not what I wanted. Okay, so this is about Rust. It's for the Java programmers. Um, it's not. It's not about how you work with Java and Rust together. It's about how you can look at other languages like Rust and and get ideas and maybe um, um, learn from them. Or if you if you like to explore different things and maybe program with things that aren't Java. Maybe you have another job somewhere or, or like the hobby. That would be something you could do. Hello. Yeah. I suspect this may be my phone thing. Nope. You may clap now. All right. Let's see what's going on because this doesn't make sense. And this is even in the cloud, so I can't blame myself. Start from the start. That is not the start. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay, so the views and opinions expressed here do not reflect my employer. I'm the director of development at Climate Control Group. We're a, um, we're a manufacturer of air conditioners. So we make, um, and we use Java, so we're a Java employer here in OKC. We have like six different companies here in the OKC area. Um, we're owned by a Swedish company um, named Neba, and that's great. They're a wonderful company to work for and with. And um, so if you, if you find yourself, you know, I don't know if we're allowed to do this here, but if you want to, if you're ever looking for work or you want to come talk to me afterwards, then please do. We don't, we don't have any openings and I don't intend to. I just like rejecting people. So come talk to me. Um, I'm working through that with my therapist. And here's my therapist. He's Dr. Emmett Meridian. And he specializes in software development. So we have lots of issues, and he can help. He, um, he has, um, he's really good. Um, he'll help you work through your issues. You can Google his name and, um, and if you want to contact him. Um, so he's got these ideas, and he calls it the circle of development needs. And safety is one of them. Tooling, reach, expressiveness, and performance, strep. And he calls that the, the circle of needs. Um, so, yeah, it's not a circle. So I told him that in the session. I was like, that's not a circle. And he, he said, oh, okay. So he went back and he wrote it down and he drew it like, you know, in a, in a circle and came back and he said, by the way, that just cost you 30 bucks for me to draw that circle. So, um, I don't talk back to him so much anymore. Um, so let's go over what the, what the letters in strep mean. The first one's safety, and safety is the confidence you would get from um, being able to make changes to your code, or being able to write code and deploy it and have confidence that it's going to work and it's gonna do what you want it to do. And we get that in several different ways. We, we have, well, with Java, we like, we like our types and we like our static checking. Um, but that's not everything. We have unit tests, we have integration tests, we have code reviews, and we hope that when we, um, when we deploy it that everything works. You may have less of that with some of the other languages um, that are not statically typed, like a, well, JavaScript. JavaScript's a popular one. PHP. Um, I call those YOLO languages. And you hit the button, you deploy, and you kind of hope that that works. Um, tooling is the stuff that gives you strong yak shears. It's what you really don't care to do. It's not about the job you're trying to do, but it's what you need to get the job done. And so if you've ever worked in a language where you don't have good IDE support, that's not fun. Um, you have build tools, packaging tools, dependency managers, testing in your CI pipeline. 
Um, Rust has a Rust has a strong um, story to tell here. It's um, well, we'll go over the differences between Rust and Java in a later slide. I know that I know that as we when we start off, we come to one of these talks and we want to see another language. The first thing you want to do is just show me the language. So I'll get to that soon. Reach is where you can deploy to. The desktop, people used to run desktop apps. I think Java gave that up years ago. No one's tried. There was like JavaFX was like a futile attempt at, what's that? It's still going strong. JavaFX is still going strong, okay. Um, so that's a thing. <laughs> um, network servers seems to be where everything's strong with Java. If you want to write a network server, that's a, that's a good platform to target. You have the cloud now, which is slightly different from network servers. Um, mobile, um, you would think Java would be too big for mobile, but um, then Android came along and you're actually writing Java even though it's not the JVM. Uh, embedded languages, IoT is something that seems to be getting a lot of talk, so it's important to be able to write small code for embedded platforms. Um, the browser. Um, the browser's been big for a long, 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 long time, and, and so JavaScript is the only language on the browser um, until recently, I think in February this year, was when they actually ratified the, um, the WASM spec. So WASM is WebAssembly, and so now you can take other languages and instead of compiling them to JavaScript, you compile them to WebAssembly. Um, the advantage of doing that over JavaScript is a whole nother talk. That's, but there are advantages. It's smaller and it's easier to parse, I think, is the main reason. Um, and then you have systems. Rust bills itself as a system programming language. And by that means, it means you could write it in things that you care about performance. And performance in this case would be, you know, how much memory it uses, how fast it is, um, the footprint, and you want to make sure it works. So you could write an operating system in Rust, and, and somebody did. Well, more than one person did, but Redox is, I believe, the, um, the main one. They have a whole operating system written in Rust. Um, if you want to write a CLI, a, client, a command line program, you could do that in Java, and so you would type whatever, ls, and then you'd wait for the JVM to boot up and, and then it would list your directory listing. So you don't want it for small, quick programs, but Rust may, may fit that bill. And then you have services that are running on the operating system. Um, that would be a good, a good target for Rust. So expressiveness, what is expressiveness? It's kind of a catch-all word for the um, for the power that you that you get being able to write, you want as a programmer, you want to feel powerful. You want to feel like you can do things, and and there's probably some Kotlin people, Scala people, out there, and those are those are a great step forward. Um, and actually, if you're still doing Java now and your employer's not making you, you should actually go try Kotlin because it's there's really almost no reason not to with Scala gets into more advanced type system stuff and that can make you feel powerful I feel like it's kind of a slippery slope to Haskell and you'll end up doing all this type system buggery and and then realize you don't need other people and transcend um, annotations and macros are other ways that in Java we get power to be able to say here's what I want to do and I don't have to express it all in code and, and make it happen. Macros, Java doesn't have macros, Rust does. That's something that we'll, we're gonna look at. Um, and the last P is performance. That should be, um, well, it, it's not exactly, when everyone hears performance, they think of speed. But that's not what performance is about now. Google seems to measure their when they talk about algorithms, they measure them in the operations or performance per watt. So electricity is a big deal now. You talk about data centers, that's the main cost of data centers. Um, when you talk about mobile phones, the, your battery life is important. Um, so electricity, CPU usage, memory usage, those are all important. 
Um, oh, and since this is the Java users group, I put one of those large phones with the big buttons so that you can just dial. There's, we're a little bit more tenured here than they are at the JavaScript, JavaScript one. Okay, let's just jump straight to a live demo. So everyone wants to see Rust. And I worry about this being a little bit washed out, so forgive. Um, and by the way, I'm not gonna show you Rust. I know you wanna see it. I'm gonna show you Java. Um, I'm gonna show you a REST service that I wrote using Wildfly. Wildfly is a JWE application. We use these at work all the time. So we went to, we recently went to Docker. I say recently, a few years back. And so we used to have everything in a JWE server and we deployed to it and life was great. And then we split everything up into services. And now we have a bunch of JWE servers running. And JWE is, is not known for being the quickest to start up or low in memory usage, and that is something that you notice once you have a whole lot of them running, and, and production is down, and you gotta move it to a different node and start up all the services on a different one. Um, I have a few nightmares from that. But here's, here's what it looks like, and this is familiar to me. This is kind of what I, what I see as the as an easy to understand REST service. And it's, it's kind of expressive because you just kind of, you say what you want it to do. You're giving, a, you're giving a what kind of operation it is, the HTTP verb. You have a path that you want it to resolve to. You say what kind of text you're putting back right here. And then you're just returning a string. It, it, it maps directly to a Java method, which is what we're familiar with. We annotate the paths up there and, and it's all kind of magic behind the scene. And the magic happens through, through JAX-RS is the spec and, and the JWE server provides, provides all the wiring together for you to do this. And it should basically work. Let's see if it works. Um, oh, so by the way, this is not actually Wildfly, it's, it's not a server, it's a, it's a project called Wildfly Swarm. So Wildfly Swarm is, because Wildfly is way too big, Wild, Wildfly Swarm is a project where we, um, they realize that we have to make things smaller for the cloud, things are becoming more nimble, and so it's just enough application server compiled into a jar so that you can just run it as a Java jar. And that's what it's doing now, and it ran a Java jar and hopefully I can, um, you know, open a browser. And the browser says, see the path here is hello, Jill 19. Hello, 19 year old Jill from Wildfly. So it works, which is always good in a demo. And we're gonna come back and look at some of the performance characteristics of this versus the other um, REST services that I implemented. So let's look at a different one because um, as a spoiler, this one was a little bit heavy even though it's the stripped down version of JWE services. So I, I went around the web and I looked for Java, REST, and then I typed in words like lightweight and fast and I found a web, something called Spark Java that's, that said it was blazingly fast and so I I thought, you know, I'm gonna try that one too. So let's see if I can. There's Java Spark. Oh, Maven, okay. I might talk about Maven later. Depends on how much time we have. So here's your app in Java Spark, and it's slightly less abstract. Um, it wouldn't log unless I put logging in there. I, I'm a newbie here, so, so feel free to ignore this. This isn't essential to the thing, but we have, um, 
instead of having annotations that tell you where to go, you just call these methods and they use lambdas. And you pass in a path and map it to a result. You don't have to say what type of thing you're returning. It figures that out for you, so that's kind of nice. It feels um, less familiar to me. I don't want to it's not, that's not a judgment thing, but I like the other one better from an expressivity standpoint. And it, it works, we hope. Let's start it up. Well, that was quicker. And I'm running all these on different, um, different ports. Um, so this is hello Joe and he's 32. Hello Joe, 32 year old from Java Spark. Okay, so let's look at the rest now. So this is what the Rust web service looks like. It's, it's um, you have this stuff at the top of the file that's compiler, directives, plugins, whatever. And so this is not the normal type of Rust code you'll see. It, it would be much more verbose and C-like. Um, but this is an example of the kind of things you can provide via frameworks. So because, because they have a lot of magic that you can do, in Rust, behind the scenes. You do this via macros, you do it through the type system, um, and it has a rather unique type system. And it's got several different types of macros. And so this is a macro up here. It's a, it's a, it, it's basically you get a macro and it passes in whatever's below it. So I, all I have to do is say, I've got a, I've got a string, I've got an age, I've got this, and I've got, a path, and I decorate it with the path. I have this here. Let's see if this works. Well, that was quick. And it came up. A 22-year-old named Fred. So same Rust, same Rust service implemented three different ways. And I did want to look at the performance of it, but before we look at the performance, I think it's worth going back and looking at the Java one and talking about safety, because safety is the first letter of strep. So with the, with the stringly type languages, you can, you can do a typo, you can, you can bring down your application, and that's not a good thing. And so what could I typo here that would, that would bring it down? Would you guys have noticed if I had made that say aged there? Um, and we would not have found out about that until, well, until we ran it. Or, yeah, and hopefully we have a test that, that covers that. Let's. Let's just verify that. Let's see what it does to us. Oh, I'm sorry, we have to wait for Wildfly to boot. Almost there. That's okay, customers aren't waiting. Is it? I haven't tried that. Um, since we were coming from Wildfly, we did the swarm thing, but that's uh, that is interesting. Okay, so it gives this nice error message that says "rest easy, unknown path param blah blah blah." Well, that doesn't feel very safe to me. That doesn't give me a warm fuzzy. Um, are there other things that I could have typoed 
in here that would have done the wrong thing. Um, well, I guess I guess the format strings are something that you can you could typo if I had a D there instead of an S, it would compile happily and it would it would so so what you end up doing is you have that's it yes tooling idea would have caught that. And that's kind of what you want to do. You want to catch it at compile time, and you can do that with tooling. You can do that at runtime too, but at runtime it's not fun because it's already gone. The other one is similar. You have these strings that you pass in, so I'm not going to make you watch me type the wrong string. Um, and then see that it doesn't come up, but trust me. That's what happens. Now let's go back and look at Rust. Um, no, not really. Okay, so suppose I left off a, this, so this is a string up here. Well, you can't see where my mouse is pointing. This is a string up here. Um, here's a string in here. And suppose I you know, left off the, the bracket of this string and this is not the IDE, this is the compiler telling me, hey, the parameter's missing a closing bracket. Now the compiler doesn't have any idea about what this REST framework is, and it doesn't know anything about the, the magic macro we put at the top, and so the library author made his macro check that string and then report it to you. So you, it's not, if it was built into the compiler, it, that would be what it did, and then you're stuck with whatever the people who make Rust want you to do, but by putting the power for that kind of static checking in the hands of library authors, you get this, uh, lots of different things getting tried, and this, oh, by the way, this is called Rocket, the, the name of the web framework. There's, there's several, Active, Actix Web is another popular one. Um, so I'm gonna put the bracket back, I said I'm going to put the bracket back and my red squiggly will go away. And so what if I, you know, mistyped one of these? It would probably hopefully catch that and then, yes it did. It says, hey, you have a parameter here that you're not using. Um, likewise, we don't have, we don't have an IDE that catches, catches this, but the compiler caught when I take away one of the um, format strings that it's not used. And so you get more of this um, static checking than you might be able to get with other languages. And some of the static checking, this is kind of a, kind of a trivial surface thing. Um, the static checking that it really gives you is static checking for the control flow of the application. They call it the borrow checker. We'll go over that, but it's, um, it makes it to where it can catch things that, or you can define libraries and write code that you can then put constraints in place so that people that are using your code can't screw it up. That's the idea. And the people that are using your code are, you know, somebody else on your team, you work in a team, or it could be you six months later and you've forgotten what constraints you wanted to put on this. Okay. Let's go back. To a presentation. Live demo time's over. Yeah. Okay, so it's a Java users group. How do we get our Java code to talk to Rust code and our Rust code to talk to Java code? And the answer is you don't. Um, and you, you actually, you can, and, and, but it kind of defeats the purpose. So you have Rust over here that its point is that it provides more safety than you can get with the Java compiler and it gives you smaller code 
and then if you bolt on a JVM to it, then you've kind of destroyed that. You have Java, which provides a lot of, um, oh, the libraries. The, the ecosystem behind Java is something that you really, really um, hate to give up. And that's the nice thing about moving to Kotlin or Scala is that you can reuse those libraries. But with Rust, you can do it, but um, it's not going to be it's not going to be easy, and you know, basically, you're going to use the Java native interface um, and and the foreign function interface for so you Rust can pretend to be C code if you annotate it the right way, and it'll it'll pretend to be uh, J and I, and you can call Rust code from Java, and you can call Java from Rust. So if you look at the this project, I almost did this, and um, and I probably still will, because I wanted to write a, a Rust program to talk to the database I use at work, which is DB2. Now, who uses DB2? We do. And there, the, the drivers for it, you're not going to find a driver for Rust, because who's going to write that? And you have a JDBC driver for anything and everything in the world, and it's open source, and it's wonderful. So it's like, I need to use JDBC drivers in my Rust code. There is an ODBC driver, but it is not open source, I think. You have to kind of get an IBM account and download it. They have a... Um, yes. yes, we do. We do. But if you're, if you're going to distribute it, though, and it's like I want to write something that if, I, if I'm writing it in my own time, I want to be able to distribute it outside of work. That's really the issue. Um, this is, it, it kind of shims up a, a JVM and calls into it from Rust, and, and I probably will end up using this, and, and we'll see how it goes. It's tempting. Okay, so the borrow checker. What is the borrow checker? The borrow checker is the portion of the Rust compiler that keeps track of ownership. And why does it need to keep track of ownership? It, it, has, it has certain rules. It's like every variable or every piece of memory in Rust has an owner that's a variable. And it keeps track of who's the owner at the time. And you can borrow the memory from that. That's why it's called the borrow checker. Um, and it has certain rules that it applies that keeps bad things from happening. And the types of bad things that happen don't happen in Java. But if you go way back to C, C++, um, where you had to manage your memory, you could, you know, allocate some memory, assign it to a variable, you know, pass it to a function somewhere, and the function would make a copy. It would still be pointing to this memory. You'd free it, and it would try to access it, and your program's going to blow up. And what it does is it statically tracks where everybody has access to any bit of memory and, um, and enforces that certain rules are in place. And the rules are here. Um, they're a little bit more complicated, but it's, it's, it's that you can borrow something once if you want to change it mutably, um, or you can give out multiple borrows to things if you, if you make it immutable. And the reasoning behind that is if you give somebody, you know, two people something and then one person changes it, this person doesn't see the changes or you have to do some kind of synchronization logic to, to make that happen. And and so Java solved this problem, and it was the first, the first I guess, mainstream language that had the garbage collection. And so how it solves it is it just makes more. It'll, you make new objects, and you don't worry about them. You, you throw them back to the machine, and the machine comes by and fixes, cleans them up with the garbage collector, um, and your code doesn't have to worry about it. You don't have to think about it. Um, in Rust, you have to think about it, although it's a guided think about it. You, the, like in C, you have to remember to allocate and remember to deallocate. That's a burden on you. Um, in Rust, you can't do it wrong because the compiler makes you do it right. But that makes you angry sometimes because the compiler makes you do it right because, you know, when you can't get your code to compile, that can be frustrating. Oh, 
what else do I want to say about the borrow checker? So Java solved the problem for memory. Um, it doesn't just apply to memory though. Any type of resource that you have can be tracked. So it's it's kind of it's kind of more generic. It solves a more generic problem than Java solved with a garbage collector. Um, take an example, say you have a database connection. And the Java compiler does not garbage collect your database connections. Um, generally you have libraries that will make a connection pool for you and as long as you remember to close it, it will, it will take it back into the pool if you, if you throw it away, it'll maybe eventually notice that it's idle and reclaim it. But that's all added abstraction on top of, um, on top of the basic thing you're doing. And so once you get into the rules of the borrow checker that apply to memory, um, they also apply to almost any resource you could have and they prevent data races. Um, they say guaranteed. Um, there's a guarantee that you're not gonna have a data race in Rust and you're not gonna have a memory segmentation fault. You're not gonna have a use after free. You're not going to have a, um, well, the other type of memory errors you get. The, if you look at the CVEs um, for security, um, that's the main thing. When you're talking about system languages, most of the security problems that happen in, um, in systems, so like if you look at the Linux kernel, most of the memory most of the security problems with it are memory related. Somebody did a buffer overrun, somebody did a use after free, somebody did a type of, um, a type of um, access in memory where they didn't keep track of it right and suddenly now somebody can own your server. So Rust is at least billed as something that you can use to make your code more secure through the safety mechanisms that the borrow checker provides with the caveat that you got a learning curve because the compiler is going to gripe at you if you do something that doesn't match the rules that it set out for you. And it's also, you may have to, you may have perfectly valid code that the borrow checker can't prove is secure and you're not going to be able to do it. You have kind of an escape hatch in Rust where you mark it as unsafe and you keep going. Um, but you also have ways of doing programming that um, don't rely on that type of unsafe access. One would be, um, the borrow checker can't figure out cycles in memory. So if you had a graph that had a cycle in it, then it's not gonna let you do that directly. You would have to program it in a way where you use some kind of off, out of graph index to be able to represent the, um, the memory references. That may have been too weedy. Um, okay, so cargo, what is cargo? Cargo's like Maven. So we're, this is the tooling aspects of it and cargo is, cargo is like a breath of fresh air. It really is. Let me see. If I go and no. If I go and say I want to make an app, I say cargo and it and I name it um, OKC and it makes an application for me. It, it puts this cargo.tml or it's a TOML file, excuse me, and it, which just has, so this is your POM file basically and you put your dependencies in here um, and it, it actually initialized a uh, Git repository for me. It by default assumes that you're gonna be using version control and, and all that's configurable, but it gives you a really nice set of defaults. And when I was setting up, you know, it's been a while since I've, since I've set up a project in Maven, so I'm like, okay. Um, let me make a new project for the, for the jug, and I'm just gonna do a um, Maven init. No, that doesn't work. I'm gonna do a Maven init, um, OKC jug. Oh no, that doesn't work. So then I go Google it and I'm like, okay, Maven init and it gives me, I think the one I looked at was here. It gives me this thing, so I copy and paste it and change it and it worked except it by default used Java 7 instead of Java 8, I don't know why. So, so I stubbed my toe several times coming into Maven 
um, coming back from Maven. And some of that's because I, I had been away from it long enough to where I was a newbie to it. And Cargo's a little bit more newbie friendly. Um, so, you know, one thing you can do if with Cargo, you have Cargo. Um, build, check, clean, run. It has the, it's, it's like, you have built in everything that I wanted to do at least, and they do have plug-in systems, but this worked out well for me. Um, Cargo is based on, so if you have a package manager and it handles dependencies, well, where's your central Maven repo? Um, Crates.io is the, is the centralized one. You can also point to um, private repos or Git repositories, but this is where you get all of your dependencies. Okay, WebAssembly. Some tinkering still re required. So we talked about WebAssembly as being a platform that you may want to deploy to. If you're writing um, JavaScript and you end up saying, oh, I want to take advantage of some of these safety of features or I want to do something that's a little bit more performant and I want to write it in Rust or some other language that compiles to WebAssembly, then you can do it. And there are frameworks around that. Um, U is the is the one that I was just not getting to run um, over here before the before the jug. So this um, this nice error message is the result of me trying to. Um, well, I'm not going to debug that. But I swear other people say it works. Let me show you the website. So the idea being if you want to write something that runs in the web browser and you don't want to use Java, here's what, okay, so now you can finally see Rust code. Um, This is modeled after Elm. I don't know if anyone's looked at Elm. It's a, it's a language, it's a, a functional language that compiles to JavaScript and it has some, can you even see that? It's very washed out, okay. Um, it's a functional language that compiles to JavaScript and it has the ideas like in, like in Redux where you have a model, you have updates to the model, um, change the state of the model and you do, you render your view from the model and they have this separation of concerns with the rendering and that's called the Elm architecture and this is kind of modeled after the Elm architecture but it's in Rust and because it's in Rust it can compile to WebAssembly and you can Let's see if it works. If I don't do the release version. Like that's a whole, that's a whole application there. Okay, while that's compiling. Yes, please, questions, anytime. Yeah, so that's, that's this, and, and you're not, it's actually just the slide. I really wanted to show the dude where's my car. So, so yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about our objects and where they went and classes in Java. Um, Java has classes and they have encapsulation, they have inheritance, and Rust does not have that. And that's a good thing. At least they say that's a good thing. Um, 
what you have is if you're holding any data, you have a struct. So here's your structs. Um, enums are the equivalent of union types where you, yeah, well, it's like an enum in Java. Um, they have traits. I don't see a trait on here. Um, traits are like interfaces. And then you implement methods outside of the actual struct. So you're implementing some method called, or some trait called component for model. And model is just a holder of data and not much data, it looks like in this application, um, because it's empty. But the nice thing about that is you can implement, you can implement methods on things that you didn't write. And you're probably used to that in C Sharp and, and JavaScript, of course. Um, it's, they're extension methods in C Sharp. You can also make data available to other people and they can write methods for it or implement traits for it. So I don't know, does that answer your question? This is a, this is a trait, the component is. Models a struct and you implement it independently. Say it again. Oh, you mean right here? You are attaching functions to this struct, to the model. Uh, yeah, properties, no. There's no properties. Okay, yeah. That is a type that's associated with it. They call it associated types. Um, it's kind of the poor man's versions of higher kinded types. If you're familiar with that, if you're a Scala guy, um, it, it gets you about 57% of the way there. Um, You know what we should do? We should play with the um, we should play with the borrow checker. Um, talk about mutability and borrows because the ampersand that's a borrow. Mute that size says you can have a mutable borrow. If I give that, so it's taking a mutable borrow to self, and it knows that no other code can change um, model while this code is running. It's not the equivalent of the synchronized keyword because I think synchronized keyword is a runtime thing, but it has the same effect and it enforces it at, pile time, at compile time. Um, so let's open a different project. Oh, well. No, I don't want to save that. Can anyone tell me what this code is going to do? It's going to fail at runtime. Yeah. It's going to fail with a concurrent modification exception. Yep. And so that's a, so you shouldn't be changing a list while you're doing it. And it's not, it's, well, it's right in front of you, so, so it's not always that obvious in that you may be calling a method in here that has access to the list that then changes the list while you're iterating through it. So this, this type of thing can happen and it's, it's, um, it's illustrating the type of memory, um, the borrow checking that the Rust compiler gives you. So let's look at the, an equivalent one in Rust and the reason why I'm doing this is because you, we can then, you see the mute keyword it's visible. Let's make it really big. So here's a program and I can make a vector, kind of like a list, and I can remove something from the, from the vector. If I, I said that that vector was mutable, and if I hadn't said that the vector was mutable, it would not let me remove anything from the vector. Um, and type where you mean it. Uh, 
And so if I wanted to modify this in, in a loop, it'll figure out that you can't do that. And the reason you can't do that is it's saying that it moved vector um, into the loop and you cannot modify it from there. So it's keeping track of where you can and can't modify things and preventing you from doing it. And you kind of internalize these rules as the compiler keeps telling you, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. The compiler never says what you can do, which is kind of lopsided. Good question. That's a that's a macro. That's that's one of the forms of macros. So the the two forms of macros. One of them's a vector, or I'm sorry, one of them's a, a bang macro where you have an exclamation mark. And the reason why they do that is all the macros that are in your code have this exclamation mark. You can recognize them as macros, and they're not as scary as macros may be in the other language because they do literally get type checked. So you can yes expand it at compile time um, you know loop unrolling it uses LLVM in the back end so it gets all the optimizations you would get from LLVM um, which is many 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 man hours of optimization um, generics is another thing you may be curious about if I write a generic it looks just like um, well, let's see if I can. And let's call this X. Okay, so I just made a struct that has an integer. Um, integers are just like in Java, except you have the various, the sizes may be important to you, so you have an I32, an I64. Um, and I am sized, which will take the, the platform size. And so if I had wanted this to be something like that, actually I would implement I don't think I have enough stuff on here to be able to show you generics. So what's it complaining about here? Okay, I'm gonna have to go look up an example to do types, but they look, they're in angle brackets, just like Java. They're monomorphized in that they get expanded. Um, it, all the client sites that call it um, will, rather than at runtime doing dispatch, it does expansion and monomorphization at compile time. So if you have somebody calling it in the context of a string, it'll make an actual method with the string. And if you have somebody contact, calling it in the context of an int, it'll make an actual and um, so it builds actual binary code yes yes and that was yep that's exactly exactly what happens. Sometimes it's, it's rare that you don't want that behavior and you can control that through, you know, various directives, but that is the default behavior. So, Gonna work. No, I just need to use the self keyword. I'm suffering from don't know what you're doing syndrome. 
Um, this is why we should probably be looking at um, other code. I actually worked through Project Euler for some of these and then, and then said, oh yeah, I need to do a jug and then forgot about it. Uh -huh. Okay, so so the default is a vector. Um, you it's not an array, and so you can a vector is singly. No vector is backed by an array, um, and you saw that macro that was used to create them. That's that's because it's it's a little bit more complicated when it creates it. You don't want to type that every time you do it, but vector would be their default collection, but they have a whole collections library. And so in Java, you would create an array, you would create a list, and you add things in, you maybe, you could pass the list to some other function, and it could do something, it could store it, it could give it to another thread, and then you could start adding things to the list, and it would change the list that they had and it may resize it dynamically and it figures that all out internally because you have the reference to it and it's pointing to where it's going. So it does not do that. What it does is it keeps track, it will resize internally, but it will not resize, a, I can't do that and give you, a, I can't give you a list and then resize it. At least I can't give it to you mutably. I can't give it to you with the ability to, actually I can't even give it to you while I resize it. This is where the concurrency kind of comes in. So I, I have a list and I can add things to it and it'll resize, the, I have a vector, excuse me, and it'll resize the vector and resizing the vector may actually change the pointer of where it's going to. And so that would be a bad thing where you don't have as much indirection like you would have on a Java list. So the code that takes the list cannot hold that list while I can still change the list. So if something is borrowed, you can't change If I'm the owner, yeah. Okay. So if I then loan it to you, or yeah, loan it to you mutably, so that you can change the list, then I'm not allowed to change the list. And it keeps track of that. So yes, you can update it, but, and it will actually grow the array, and by growing the array, when you have an array, you don't just grow the array because you don't have memory. You make, allocate a whole new thing of memory, copy everything over to it. I mean, it's a big deal. Um, it's a big deal in terms of systems programming, but it's not a big deal in terms of Java where you have this type of memory usage that um, you wouldn't notice that kind of thing. Oh, we're running near the end, so that reminds me, I did have one more demo that I did want to get to. Um, speaking of memory. So, 12 when? 12.45? Okay. Okay, so all the, the REST services that we made, I, I built those with, um, built those with Docker. Has anyone ever used Docker with the multi-stage builds? That is so cool, we just started using that. So you look at like the Wildfly one, and let's look at this Docker file. The build is just the Docker file. And so you're saying, hey, I need a, I need a Maven image and I do all the building in the Maven image and then you um, do a reset to Alpine. So Alpine JDK and, and you copy only that jar that it generated. It generated a fat jar for you to run, and so now when you're running in Docker, you don't have an operating system. You don't have to have an operating system in your image. You can do it from um, scratch, but unless you need a, unless you need a JVM, in which case you find the smallest JVM image you can use, and I, I think that's the smallest one. Um, Alpine's known for being fairly small, and you copy it into it. Say it again. Yes. Alpine is like a five meg Linux distribution. So it's very small compared to 
what you would normally have if you did the default Ubuntu or Debian image, you'd be hundreds of megabytes versus the, versus the five. And so this is one way because, you know, what I'm looking at is how, how big are these, um, how big are these objects, these, these containers that I want to run? The image size does make a difference. And I'll show you the Rust one too, just for fun. Here's a Docker file, and I do the building in one image, and then throw away everything and start from scratch. Um, I can use scratch here because Rust compiles to a static binary. Um, the only thing that's going to be in this container is the compiled code that I did from Rust. There's no operating system, there's no um, JVM, and that makes it smaller. And smaller has some advantages when you're paying for your CPU usage, and your, if you're in the cloud, you get an AWS bill or you get some kind of bill at the end of the month, and if you want to be happy when you get the bill, you keep things as small as possible and as fast as possible and use the least amount of CPU and the least amount of memory. That's the motivation um, for this. So I wanted, one of the things that I wanted to compare was startup time of the various of the various containers that I made, and I made a container called Hello JavaSpark, Hello Wildfly, Hello Rust. So I'm just gonna time Hello Wildfly. I'm going to time, not Hello Wildfly. I'm gonna time. Oh, do you wanna see what's in that shell script? So we're just basically running Docker um, deploying it to Docker and then looping on curl until it actually responds. So it's kind of a measurement of how long it takes you to start this app and then, um, and then actually get a page from it. So if I do time and time wildfly, it deploys and then you see all these dots going across the screen, it's, it's starting up. Starting up, you're paying for this. Okay, 17 seconds, that's, that's not great. Um, especially it's a hello world. I mean, it was, you saw it, it's like five lines long. Um, let's do the Java Spark one. Much better, like 1.8 seconds. And so, um, definitely check out Payara if you're using JWE because Wildfly Swarm leaves a lot to be desired as far as how small it can make things. And let's do the rest one. Okay, so that was, it had no dots because it immediately answered. Um, well, okay, so let's look at the size of the images now. So if I do a Docker images, And we have, we have the Wildfly one is 151. Um, Java Spark is 100. Now it's built on Alpine, so 95 of that is probably um, the JVM. And I didn't look at the jar size, but I think the jar size is actually pretty small for Java Spark, the actual code that you deploy. Um, and then the, the image size is 2 meg for the, for the Rust one. And let's look at the stats that they're running. So we have all these three containers running, and we see that the, the two Java ones are, are using some CPU just to sit there. And the Wildfly one has 420 megs of memory. The Java Spark one has 33 megs of memory. And the... Um, Rust one has 1.7 megs of memory. I wrote a, um, I co wrote a program to stress test. So the poor man's stress test is just use curl and pass in an argument to tell it to do 100,000 calls to the, to the thing. So, so we're going to stress test it. Um, 
And let's see what happens to the CPU usage. And so you see the, one, the memory starts going up. The memory's virtually unmoved here. Um, then you have a fairly large amount of CPU usage going on with the Java, and that's, that's related to the having to create new objects every time it answers memory allocations or checking the generations, the multi-generations that it's, that it's doing to collect memory. And, and the CPU usage on Rust is the lowest one out of the group. Um, speed, I don't know yet. I guess we'll find out when this finishes. I don't know how long do you think it takes to, to call a web application 100,000 times. Not that long. It didn't seem that long when I was sitting alone at night in the dark and the TV was on. It may be more. You see, oh wait, notice this. Notice how the CPUs come down. That's an artifact of the just-in-time, I'm sure. I'm sure it was doing some JIT as it was starting up and if once it found its groove, it's, it's got a lot less CPU usage than it, than it did. Um, so Rust finished, so it's down to zero. Um, let's see which one finishes next. Notice the memory here keeps going up. You can limit that when you deploy. Um, Docker's not real good about that, but you can pass in your XMX, and, and I think it would stay below, you know, 512, but there's always that worry when I deploy a Java application when I put in that limit is, does it really, is it going over the limit now because it needs to or is it going over the limit because it wants to? Because I found out what happens when you don't do any limits at all, at least with Swarm, because by default it doesn't do limits and, oh yeah, they just get bigger and bigger and bigger and then you have your, you know, your 10 gig memory process running on the server and Grumpy sysadmins. Okay, so it looks like it finished, and it was, so the Rust one was fastest, but not by much. I don't think speed is, is that big of an issue here. Once the, once the JIT kicks in, they're, they're approximately the same, and Wildfly was a little bit slower. And it's back down to using your CPU to doing nothing. Okay, you had a question? Okay. Can you say it again? So the question was, um, is, the, is Rust dependent on the platform? And it is. Um, so Java has write once, run anywhere, and that's the, that's, that's the promise. Um, and Rust, you compile for a platform. Now, it covers a lot of platforms, and it'll generally just do the thing it wants. Now, the, the distribution that we use, that I, I love about Java is I can just ship a jar and somebody can run it and I don't care what platform they're on. And that's kind of been taken over by Docker in that I can just ship a Docker image and somebody can run it. And if they're using Windows, they really need to install, um, you know, Linux Docker anyway. So. Yeah, you can cross compile. But you have, to, you have to care about that. You have to care about that enough to cross-compile. Yes. Yeah, so when we talk about library, there, there's two things. There's the architecture, and that would be Linux is an architecture, Windows, Mac OS, and if you want to ship binaries to people, you have to compile to those platforms and ship them. Now, when you care about the platform, we care about the libraries that are installed on people's machines. Well, you can't control what libraries are installed on people's machines. And that's where Docker helps some, and the other thing you can do is compile statically. What, when, and that's what I did on the, on the Hello World, was I made a static binary that doesn't have any dependencies and stuck it into a Docker container. 
you can, um, some things, some libraries that you would get from your dependencies when you go to crates.io um, may depend on certain, they're just like front ends to libraries that are already installed and they depend on those libraries to be installed. So you have to, you have to take care about that. If you, you look at your dependencies and if your dependencies are tying you to having certain libraries installed on the client machine, you have to track that and, and do whatever you would do for it. Okay, so the the most known real world example would be um, would be Mozilla. So Mozilla's rewriting parts of Firefox in Rust, and they're slowly. That's your, if you're running Firefox, you're probably running Rust. Um, Google uses it in some of their cloud tools. The the virtual machine that I have on this Chrome OS box that hadn't crashed yet. Um, is written in Rust, the manager for it. Um, it's really just KVM. Um, and another good example, real world, is I don't know. Um, I'm sure you can find one if you go to the Rust homepage. And notice I didn't read anything from Wikipedia, because I assume if you really care, then you're just going to Google it. So go to the homepage, you'll see some. But the big one is Mozilla. Mozilla is used. Um, in multiple places, and Google uses it, so it's getting some, it's getting some traction. And I think that's mainly because of the safety, um, safety issues. Um, we just did the performance part, um, that where I compared the performance of the different Docker containers, and and why I care about this is this is, this is the number of services I'm running at work and each service can have multiple containers and it, it just makes things a whole lot easier if you can make it smaller. Now these are all the Wildfly Swarm containers. So I hope to make that smaller and we're gonna be selectively looking at and we're, we're doing things like splitting apart the front end from the back end and just deploying you know, JavaScript front ends which are no memory usage, that's just Nginx and, and then you just have REST services on the back end and and it turns out that for a lot of the REST services that we do at least, um, Wildfly is just overkill. We do it because we're used to it. Yeah, Wildfly Swarm is a whole application, correct? Is that the micro profile? It's the micro profile. It only bundles in what you use. And, but apparently it needs a, a whole lot of things. We did, we did questions. Um, it is 1242. Okay, now you can clap.